Welcome to a very special First Word program. I'm Paul Crouch, Jr., your host. Stay with us. On today's program, we've got a very special guest by the name of Rick Dempsey. Former Major League Baseball player, catcher for the Orioles, won a World Series, but somebody whose life the Lord has guided continuously. And you'll see, he may not have always been perfect, but wherever the journey took him, the Lord was there. Take a look. I think you'll truly be blessed on today's program, The First Word. Welcome back to The First Word. Rick Dempsey, how are you, my friend? Good, Paul. How are you? Welcome to the program. Now, take me back. I, for those that maybe don't know professional baseball, you, you actually played this game a little bit, didn't you? I did. Um, <laughs> I started off playing organized baseball in the San Fernando Valley. I grew up in Woodland Hills as a young guy and uh, uh, was always involved in baseball programs there in high school. Um, with a, a Catholic boys' school in Encino, California. Uh, I played baseball there my junior and senior year. Mm -hmm. And after I graduated, then I signed professionally uh, with the Minnesota Twins. So mm -hmm. I'm a product of uh, California, the Los Angeles area, and, mm -hmm. and just one of the many ball players that uh, were picked out of this area. When did you really know you had what it takes to, to be professional? I mean, every kid in America, as you know, wants to play you know, professional sports, football, baseball, basketball. But when, when did you really know you had it? Well, I, I think I'd have to look at, at high, in high school. Although I started off my freshman and sophomore year as a track runner, uh, I was a miler. I ran a 426 mile when I was uh, uh, at school there, and everybody thought, well, he'll finish up uh, his high school and go on to college and be a four-minute miler. Well, I wanted to play baseball so bad, so my junior year I quit track, uh, which made me not the, the, the most popular guy in school at that time, but um, they knew my love for baseball at that time, and I think I knew then because I played semi-professional baseball around the Los Angeles area mm -hmm. and got involved with a lot of great, talented people, and I just realized I could play with these guys. I wasn't very big, uh, uh, typically not a catcher, 145 pounds as I signed out of high school. Uh, but uh, I knew then that I was quick enough, I was fast enough, I could hit well at that time, and I just knew that I had a chance. Um, it, it was in here. I knew in my heart that I could make it. Yeah. I mean, the drive. Is baseball all physical? Is, it, is there a mental aspect of the game of, of having that confidence, knowing that you can do this at a really high level for a long period of time? It's a combination of everything. And it really what I did, 
the um, the avenue that I took uh, when I ran track and baseball actually prepared me for any sport I wanted to go after. I was so well conditioned in those days. I ran 13 and a half miles every weekend back and forth to the to the ball field and back. And I was always in such good condition. I could have picked any sport that I wanted to be. I, I know I couldn't have been a football player. I just wasn't big enough and strong enough at those times. But anything else I wanted to play, I guess I could. And it worked out that baseball was my biggest love. And that was the area that I chose. For those of you, you know, or maybe in our audience that don't understand the different positions, the catcher is a very critical position, and it's very... It's tough, is it not? It is. It is tough. Talk it's the backbone of the bit. ball club. I mean, it's the quarterback of the team. It's right. the manager out on the field who has to run everything. You get your instructions off the field from your managers and your coaches and things, and you do all your pregame prep, you know, talking to other players, your pitchers and things like that. But when it, when the umpire says play ball, then the focus really goes to the catcher. He controls the tempo of the ball game. Huh. He's the one that makes all the plays work. He's the one that keeps the system in mind yeah. and everything and as you go from pitch to pitch you know the the whole game is there in front of you to control and the catcher I would think is really the number one focal point on the field I think for those who don't understand everybody would think all oh, the focus is on the pitcher but they only pitch every four or five days and you're there Every single Every day. Game. No, you're absolutely right. The most important part of any ball club is the pitching staff. Yeah. You're, but you're the guy out there that has to get every single one of them on track every day, get them deep into ball games to make the whole system work. Huh. So it, it's a very, very important job day in and day out. You have to condition yourself to be more durable and more flexible than any other player right. on the field. And you have to be strong enough to, uh, you know, to last Baseball is a very, very tough sport, mm -hmm. especially at the professional level. You go to spring training and during the season, you're looking at postseason play. You're looking at possibly being involved in 200 games. Mm. Goodness. Now, you grew you went to Catholic high school. I did. Talk about your faith a little bit growing up. Were you, did you raise in a very strong Christian home? Or I did. I was. Um, I have to even go back earlier than that grammar school. I went to a Catholic grammar school. Um, Our Lady of the Valley um, over in Canoga Park and then um, St. Mel's in Woodland Hills and then on to Crespi High School. But um, always involved in Bible study and in Bible history. Very fascinating part of a young person's life is to hear the stories of the gospel and, and everything and, and what it meant to those people. And then watching the shows on television, you know, to see how it really was back in those days, you know, and, and how strong, you know, people's faiths guided them through their whole life. And I always felt like I wasn't one of the kind of people in professional sports all of a sudden that has a revelation one day and says, Christ has become my savior. I always felt like he was there from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Now, talk about that a little bit. I mean, your faith, I guess, in the locker room, because I have heard from other players, locker rooms sometimes aren't real no. <laughs> sanctified places for, you know, Bible study and prayer. And some of the guys can be a little rowdy and, and that kind of thing. But talk about your faith in dealing with the other players. Well, you know, it, that's not just in the locker room. It's everywhere in the world. Correct. In the locker room, you get thrown in with a bunch of young guys, you know, from all parts of the world. And some are very um, uh, steadfast to their Christianity and the way they were raised. And some are not, you know. You learn to blend with everybody. And you learn to be an example to everybody through your faith. And and what you know is the difference between right and wrong. And, and I'm not here to say, you know, that I was always right because even to this day, you know, you, you, I'm not as good as I think I should be. Sure. And, you, and you get off track. But I think what I developed that I think might be a little bit different from a lot of people is a personal relationship with God and how important that really is to have in your life. Because he knows you're going to be, uh, you're not going to be good all the time. You're not going to live up to expectations. But the thing is, though, that if he realizes you're always going to come back to him mm -hmm. for questions and answers, that he will guide you along the way. And you've got to have faith and know exactly when to listen to what he has to say to you to pick the right path. Well, and the Bible says we're to be salt and light. And, you know, we want to don't necessarily, you know, put our religion in people's face faces and really smother them with it. But, you know, if, if one of the younger guys are, are having problems or they right. lose a loved one or, 
you know, did they come to you for, for advice or, or counseling or were you kind of thrust into that role at all? It's, it's kind of part of a catcher's life. <laughs> it, it, really, it is. I mean, in my job, I've learned that communicating with people and finding out what makes them tick really um, gives you an opportunity to have a, an impact on their lives. You know, and you have to learn to read people, which I think is why I lasted so long in, in professional baseball is reading those guys in the bullpen, those pitchers and those players and and the stressful part of their lives and the joyous part of their lives. You know, you've got to be able to read it on their face and guys that have problems off the field often that translated onto the field. So. That's why I spent a lot of time. When you've got 13 pitchers mm -hmm. out there in the bullpen today, it's like having 13 wives, you know, <laughs> and to try to deal with all 13 of them and find out their mood swings and what makes them yeah. tick every single day. It's a lot of time and everything. But if you don't have it in your heart to be that person to help as much as you possibly can, not that you're always going to get along with every single one of them, but to help them find their own way and to take off with their own life on their own. I mean, it's a gift for some. Some people. I'm not saying I had that, but I, there were some people that I came across that I felt like I helped a lot. The transition from high school, college on into the pros, is that a stressful time? Did, did, did the Lord kind of, did you look for guidance at that point as you're mm -hmm. hoping to move into professional sports? I wouldn't call it a stressful time for me personally. Yeah. Um, I always had, I was a high energy guy uh, and I was always anxious to find out what my next uh, trial in life was going to be. Um, when I signed at 17 years old to play professional baseball, the scouts told my mother, don't change the furniture around in his room because he's going to be back probably within the next month or two. <laughs> my mother says, no, I, I beg to differ with you. She was to always in my corner. Yeah. I beg to differ with you. I, I don't think he'll be back for a while because I wasn't very big, but I was so motivated and mm -hmm. so happy to be a professional now that I studied everybody. I asked everybody questions about, they got so tired of seeing Rick Dempsey come by and say, you know, how did you get that guy out? How do you, are we supposed to play that? How am I supposed to catch that pitch? How am I supposed to call this ball game? You know, I asked a million questions and as I kept learning and became stronger and stronger, then people started to rely on me more and more. And I think that's where it all comes together. The, the development of your own personality, uh, growing up in Christian schools and how you're going to run your life. And, and I wasn't the, the angel at all from the very beginning. I did a lot of things. I left home at 16 years old. My mother said, go ahead and go. You know, she said, I found a way to support myself, to pay my way through high school, which we went to a private school. And I wanted to stay with all the guys I grew up with. But I found a way to survive. And some of it wasn't always good. And as soon as I did something crazy, and, and I did some crazy things. I stole a car one time with some friends of mine and, you know, I almost got caught. One time while I was taking a carburetor out of a car one time, I saw the police come rolling into an alley and one of them grabbed me by the shoulder. That was the day I realized what I was doing was wrong. And I changed my life then in that respect. I said, I could have had a tremendous negative effect on my whole life had I been caught. Mm. But God allowed me a chance, wow. a second opportunity to make some decisions in my life. Good. And I did. I said, I never, ever want to steal anything again. I'm going to be a different kind of person. And as I went on, you know, things start to open up to you That's and good. you start to see a clearer path. Well, and, and it seems like you know, there's an element of talent. You had to have a natural, you know, certain God-given mm -hmm. talent. But work ethic is a huge part of it too, is it not? The, it the is. The amount of work you put into the it. The foundation that I had, the track broke, you couldn't tire me out. It was, I was and from the moment I got up in the morning till I went to sleep at night, you could not wear me out. Mm -hmm. I could play sports and especially baseball uh, you know, until the cows came home. It, yeah. Yeah, um, it was an easy sport for me, but how I learned to play, the talent that I had. I had the speed. Now it was a matter of learning what I needed to learn about being a catcher. You watched guys, the Johnny Benches of the world. He was the number one catcher in right. baseball at the time. How did he throw? What was he capable of doing? What were his times getting rid of the ball, throwing it to second base? How did he block home by? I watched those guys all the time, every opportunity I got. And then every opportunity I got to ask guys like Pete Rose, how did you hit Tommy John so well? You know, what did you do? You know, but and I tried to incorporate that into my style of play. 
And pretty soon I became a pretty strong defensive player. I could block any ball you put me, you threw in the dirt. I could make any throw. I could, I sat there and practiced throwing to second base, first base, hours a day. And even in the wintertime, when they talk about pitchers can't throw 100 pitches a game, right. I threw 100 throws to each bag every other day in the wintertime. So I could hit a quarter dangling from a rope from behind home plate, getting yeah. rid of the ball as quick as I could. So I was totally prepared to be in the professional yeah. baseball. What advice would you give young people that, that really think they have the talent that want to play professionally or, or go on you know, beyond high school or college, what would you tell them? I'm sure you get asked that a lot. Well, you know, the, the preparation uh, for professional sports is something that uh, it just has to be there. And I think you know, if a young player wanted to play professional baseball, he has to get into it long before, maybe a semi-professional atmosphere or even a, a high school or a college atmosphere where um, you start to get a little bit deeper into the game and the mechanics of the game and preparing yourself to be away from home that seems to be a big transition for most younger play. What is it going to be life? Is your life settled? Do you have control of your life before you even begin a professional life on the road? It's a very, very tough life. Yeah. That The glamour is there. The lights are there. Everything is there. How are you going to react to it? Not a lot of young people prepare themselves for the long haul. Well, the other thing that I know has changed, because I've heard it from other athletes, the money. The yeah. money is oh. very different now than it was when you played. Can you even talk about your salary back in the day <laughs> or what the kind of money that, the, that they're making now? Uh, well, no, I started off my first, uh, I was prorated because I came up late into this, my first season in 1969. And at that time, the minimum salary was $13,500. So now the minimum salary is $450,000. Uh, you know, a lot of guys can go a long way on that salary nowadays, even as a rookie. Right. Um, but um, back in those days, uh, you didn't get an opportunity to save a lot of money, and there wasn't a lot of money in the game. But mm -hmm. I was involved with every strike and every lockout that there was in the ball in the game of baseball. Mm -hmm. So um, we are actually, I was part of changing the face of the game. Free agentship was a huge part of the salary increases uh, by, and by all professional athletes and all professional sports. Mm -hmm. But now it is one of the biggest deterrents in the game and very, very tough to deal with. Yeah, I was gonna say, has it made the game better? Um, not necessarily, yeah. because uh, it has in some respects, is that uh, now more players are, are getting a salary now that in today's world they can survive with easily. Right. right if they're smart enough to know how to handle it from the very beginnings. I have seen so many players, Paul, that have come in and made huge amounts of money overnight, signing bonuses, $6 million. You know, they're going to get $3 million of that put in their pocket, you know. Right. And how do they orchestrate that? Because in two or three years, it could be over with. Right. And so many of them have, have really given away uh, great opportunities to, to do things with their life after baseball. Mm -hmm. They'd have thrown it away, buying cars, right. uh, chasing women, going around the world, doing all sorts of things that they really didn't keep it in their mind what they needed to do with that money. Yeah, I hear you. You know what? If you're just joining me, I'm here with Rick Dempsey, professional baseball player. We're going to get more into kind of the specifics because you played in a... a, a couple of World Series, did you not? I was lucky. I played uh, <laughs> for someone who wasn't supposed to make it out of their first spring training. I got 24 years in professional wow. baseball. I got six divisional championships and three yeah. World Series, and two of them were winners. We took the other one to the seventh game. So the accolades uh, that I received were far more than I thought I ever deserved. But it was so fun because I learned the system of baseball early on, and it carried over even right. late in my career. More with Rick Dempsey. We'll be right back. A pair of shorts. Got my sunroof. <laughs> but there's only one thing better. I like that old time rock and roll. That kind of music just soothes my soul. I reminisce about the days of old. With that old time rock and roll. Hey!
Well, there was a whole lot of shaking going on out at the stadium that night, and if you weren't there, I think you missed a really good time. Hi, my name is Rick Dempsey of the Baltimore Orioles. Well, yeah. A little bit louder now, a little bit louder now. month for a donation of any amount the word network will send you this beautiful cross necklace inlaid with a beveled design and detailed with rhinestones all set in a gold finish with beaded chain first corinthians 118 says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are saved it is the power of god wear this stunning cross as a statement of your faith or give it as a gift to family and friends we appreciate your generosity and donation of any amount so call now and your gold cross necklace will be rushed to you immediately the phone number is 855-730-WORD that's 855-730-9673 you can write us at word network church 20733 west 10 mile road southfield michigan 48075 or simply go online to thewordnetwork.org and click the donate button. Thank you for supporting the Word Network. Because of your prayers and faithful partnership, we're sending the word of Jesus Christ to the hurting and lost around the world. Now, Rick, it seemed to me that maybe rain delays <laughs> were one of your favorite times. Yes, no, or well, talk about that. Back in those days, yes, definitely. Um, we had an affinity for winning most of the time in yeah. the organizations that I played with. So what we kind of did when the ball game wasn't going on, we spent some time entertaining the fans and having a great time and intermingling with them. Back in those days before uh, the memorabilia crunch hit baseball, right. you could walk along the guard railing and speak to a young kid that really wanted to meet you and have maybe, you know, a batting glove or something like that, you know, right. that you had. And you could, you got person, you, you got a chance to have personal relationships with fans. Yeah. And, um, so it was kind of fun for me. When I was with the New York Yankees, I used to hang in the outfield, of course, talk to the pitcher and everything. But one of the guys that I talked to a lot was Sparky Lyle. Hmm. He was a great relief pitcher with the New York Yankees. And Sparky always talked about doing a pantomime of Babe Ruth out on the field, sliding around the tarp. I always thought, oh, yeah, that would be kind of fun, you know. So he would throw a baseball to the fans that yelled the loudest. Whatever section it was, he'd throw them a baseball. So yeah. after I left the Yankees, I kind of picked up where he left off. I started, you know, get fans more involved sure. in knowing that baseball players were real people too yeah. and that they were fun outside of baseball. So that's where that began. Well, it, it was great to see. I, I, I had never seen that, but... Players can't do that these days, can they? <laughs> can they go out there and do Elvis impersonations and anything like that? Or, well, that's all or, out of or the game. Babe Ruth impersonations yeah. and slide around the tarp? No, they're making way too much money to take that <laughs> chance on getting hurt on the tarp. And, yeah. and I did. I didn't really, I wasn't making that much money back in those days. Um, 400000 a year, maybe. That is a lot of money. Yeah. But, um, 
Yeah, I took a chance at possibly hurting myself where I couldn't play, but uh, I made it through a couple rain delay acts and everything, you know, but people enjoyed it so much the first time I did it in Boston mm -hmm. in a rain delay. Uh, got out on the tarp, the organist started playing, raindrops are falling on your head. It was the last day of the season, tied with the Red Sox for second place. The Yankees had won. Mm -hmm. So uh, I started to get everybody to sing together, and then I started sliding around the tarp, and I, I slid home, I went into the dugout, and disappeared. Well, the fans wanted me to come back out and do some more, so they started beating on that stadium. It got deafening underneath, and all my teammates said, you got to go back out there and do something else. <laughs> so I got out, and I said, I'll do the pantomime of Babe Ruth hitting and calling his famous home run. Yeah. Then I slid around the tarp and came in and everything. And then all of a sudden, after it was all over with, people enjoyed it so much, they wanted me to do it every time it got cloudy out. General managers were calling me, can you slide around the tarp for me? Or I had to put an end to that. Yeah. But it was a moment now that people still remember to this day. It was 1970, I think, 77 or 78, back in the, and uh, no one has ever forgotten it. Who were some of the more memorable players you played with that, that people would probably recognize? Well, I started off with one of the, the greatest players that I ever met in the game, Harmon Killebrew with the Minnesota Twins. Big home run hitter of his time. Rod Carew, who was a great uh, a batting champion, eight batting titles through the course of his career. Um, I went on to the New York Yankees and played with Catfish Hunter. He was one of the biggest and the best pitcher at one time that went to the New York Yankees under a free agent uh, program. And Thurman Munson, who died in an airplane accident, was one of the greatest catchers. So I was able to be in the presence of baseball greatness for a long time. I met Mickey Mantle before he died and, and guys like that and Whitey Ford, who's still alive. And, you know, these guys were the gods of baseball and I learned as much as I can from them. I played with some of the greatest in the history of the game. Eddie Murray, Cal Ripken, who was my roommate for three years. Wow. Uh, those were the kind of guys uh, that were, uh, you know, in the fast lane with me at the same time. So yeah. I had a, a wonderful career and a very blessed career to be around those kind of players. What do you miss? about baseball? The camaraderie. Mm -hmm. I also miss, I had so much fun, Paul, being a good defensive catcher and picking guys off bases and things like that and doing the things that people didn't think I could do defensively. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was a wonderful, but the camaraderie, being with those guys, I, I've often said that you'll never love anybody harder uh, then you would the day you win a World Series, and I was lucky to win two of them. And when you're mm -hmm. celebrating something that you've worked so hard for your entire life and your entire career, you just love everybody at the end, and you just want that moment to last forever. Mm -hmm. And I was so lucky to have it in my life three times in a World Series and six divisional championships. So we had a lot of celebrating wow. during the course of my Amazing. career. What do you not miss about baseball? What do I not miss about baseball? Travel. Very good. Yeah. You picked it right off. Yeah, the travel gets very, very tough. Early on when you're young, you don't mind it. You're seeing new places and, uh, and learning uh, things about the country that, that you've never seen in your life. But later on, after you've been there, done that so much, it gets old, it gets tiresome. And then you, you become a coach, which I did do for seven years at the major league level it became a real drudgery. So I'm glad I'm in television doing a little bit of kind of what you're doing now. Yeah, interesting. Take me to that magic year. It seemed like 1983. Mm -hmm. You got, you were with the Orioles. Right. And uh, was that a good year for you guys? Did you know all along you were going to make it to the World Series? I mean, talk, talk about that year and then how it cumulated. I've got to go back a little bit farther than that, 1979, when we played in the World Series against the Pittsburgh Pirates. We were all so excited to be in the World Series against a team we knew on paper was a lot better than we were. And we started off that World Series winning three of the first four games. Nobody could believe that we were on the verge of winning a World Series. Right. And so that last game, uh, at least the, the fifth game we came, everybody was was loud in, in the clubhouse. And, you know, we knew we still had to win one more game, but we thought we had it. Yeah. Well, the Pittsburgh Pirates turned the tides around. Wow. 
And I'll tell you, I, I, I kind of blame myself in a way because uh, Chuck Tanner, who was the manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates, when I was introduced to my first ball game in that World Series, we all went down the line as we all lined up down the third base line. We shook each other's hand and I looked over at Chuck and I said, Chuck, if you want to get this game over with, this series over with quick, when they get on base, let them try to steal second. <laughs> Well, they did try to steal second, and I kept throwing everybody out. Well, yeah. after that fourth game, they stopped trying to steal second base. That gave them one more out of opportunity sure. to beat us. They got the momentum against us the last three games, and we lost in 79. In 83, yeah. we played against a much tougher team with Pete Rose and Mike Schmidt and Joe Morgan and Steve Carlton. The These guys were Hall of Fame players, all put together on one team, the Philadelphia Phillies at the oh, time. The yeah, okay. they all played for the Reds at one time, except for Carlton. They all played for the Reds at one time, but yeah. we knew we were up against a pretty tough ball club. But we started out the same way, winning three of the first four ball games. Wow. Now we all went into Philadelphia in that fifth game, and I'll never forget, you could hear a pen drop in that, in that locker room on that day because we had, to, we, we had to make up for not winning the 1979 World Series. That sting was still there. It was there. still there. But it was mm -hmm. such a funny thing. There has been about three or four times in my life when I thought that I heard something in my ear that told me good things were going to happen or things that I should do. Mm -hmm. And I had a little revelation, uh, revelation that something really good was going to happen all of a sudden on that day. And I hit my first World Series home run. Yeah. Um, we won the fourth game of the World Series and beat the Philadelphia Phillies. Yeah. Eddie Murray had two home runs, but I was voted most valuable player of that World Series. Something I never, ever, I hit ninth. I was supposed to be the worst hitter in the lineup. Yeah. And I, something I never thought would happen. And driving back home, seeing all the people along the, the it, was a sub, it was a freeway series, 95 series between Philadelphia and Baltimore, seeing all the people that were just parked on the side of the freeways cheering us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an emotional moment. But when you saw in 79 how many people were so sad that we didn't win it coming off that airplane yeah. in 79, we, we almost you know, made a, a deal saying, you know, we got to bring this championship back to Baltimore again. And we did it. Greatest day of my life wow. in baseball. Yeah. Winning a World Series. I mean, you know how rare that is. That's yeah. probably... You have a better chance at probably winning the lottery than being a baseball player on a right. on a World Series winning team. I mean, how special was that? Because you know how many great players that had Hall of Fame careers never won a World Series. You just have to be lucky. Hmm. You have to be in the right place at the light, the right time. You have to be a good player. You have to be consistent. You have to be strong. So all the things that go into actually uh, physically playing a ball game. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, you've got to find a way to get everybody to play together mm -hmm. and, uh, under, the, uh, under the title of teamwork. Mm -hmm. And once you can find those kind of people, you have a chance. And even then, you don't really even know if you're going to get the breaks to be in that World Series. When you're maybe one or two outs away from a World Series, you know, maybe a couple strikes, are you praying? Are you, are you a praying man? You pray every day. <laughs> I prayed every day that I went up to a bat that, I, that something good would happen. Yeah. But yes, especially you pray especially hard. And you ask God every single day to keep you healthy, number one, mm -hmm. and strong. And number two, to help you to win. I know it's, there's so many more important things in the world at that yeah. time, but there's really so much that goes into winning a World Series. How about all the people that wake up every single morning and the reason they want to grab that newspaper is to find out what the Orioles or the team right. you did. They live and die with what you do every day. You have such a huge influence on their lives and everything. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about holding up that trophy or that mm -hmm. title. It's the effect that you have on everybody around you. It's a great, great point. Tell me about maybe a fan or a child or some interaction you had with somebody, you know, that, that knew you as a player and, and idolized you and somebody that maybe touched your life or touched your heart. Well, there was a young player, a young kid um, out of uh, Baltimore mm -hmm. um, who lived and died with the Orioles long before I ever got there. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was Ronnie Lehman. He had a disease um, that uh, Jewish people have called desotinomia. Mm -hmm. 
and it has to, an effect on your nervous system. And he came to the ballpark. He was the first young player that I'm actually, I met him when I was a Yankee. His father brought him, to, brought him to an Oriole Yankee game. And I met him as a Yankee. And then when I saw him as an Oriole, I said, hey, I recognize you. Well, I was now in his city. Mm-hmm. And he used to come to the ballpark every day. As crippled as he was, he walked into that locker room. We mm-hmm. made him part of our family. Wow. And he lived and died with us every day. Mm-hmm. And you you grew to see how important baseball was in his life because this is what made him want to get up every day. He didn't have the same kind of life that we had. Breathing was a, a hard thing for him to do. Yeah. The normal things was hard for him to do. Mm-hmm. But when we would win, there was such a look on his face. When he came into our locker room and all the players started getting on him, he loved it. He His whole life just evolved around us. And we would, we would tease him so much that one day we caught him giving brownies to the other team and we brought him up in front of a kangaroo court in the locker room and we chastised him for, for giving brownies to the other team and he felt so bad yeah. because he felt that his brownies made them beat us in that game. <laughs> But we loved him to death, and even more so uh, when Ronnie died. His parents, uh, bur- <laughs> his parents buried him in my uniform. Oh my goodness! And that is what Oriole baseball and the effect that you have on people. Mm. Uh, that's what it's all about, really, for me. Yeah, I agree. And you know, too, you're praying to win. But aren't there players on the other team praying that their side Absolutely. wins too? So, How does God so reconcile it, that? It, it, then you've got to be able to play a little bit better or <laughs> pray a little bit better. That's one or the other. <laughs> yeah. I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> yeah, no, it's tough. How did you transition then from the Orioles, uh, what, to the Dodgers? Well, there was a year in between. Uh, I got in a contract dispute with the Orioles, got angry with them. Uh, They didn't pick up the last year of my option, so I said I'd sign with the worst team in baseball for minimum salary before I ever play for the Orioles again. Totally lost control of myself. Well, God was listening to me, sent me to the Cleveland Indians. (laughs) And they were the worst team in baseball for minimum salary, too. It was a collusion year and like... But on the, uh, at the very end of that season, I met a guy at home plate I never really wanted to meet at all with Bo Jackson. Wow. He hit me at home plate, and although I held on to the ball uh, on a play, um, uh, he broke my thumb, and that pretty much finished my season and my career at that point. Um, the one good thing about that hit was I held him to less yards than Bosworth did. <laughs> right, that's good. <laughs> but actually, uh, okay, so I was a, a free agent, uh, on the market now, and I wanted to play for the Los Angeles Dodgers. It'd be the first time in my entire career I was able to stay at home and play at home. Good. So I asked uh, an official that I knew from the Los Angeles Dodgers see if they could give me a chance to just be invited to spring training. It was late in my career; I was 39 years old. Yeah. It was it was coming to an end, yeah. and and I knew it. But I wanted an opportunity to be in Dodger blue to mm. see what Peter O'Malley and the great Dodgers were all about. Greatest owner the game's ever had. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, I didn't get that call for quite a while, and it was getting, I was getting nervous, and I was at home, moved into a new house, and I was out doing some landscaping, and all of a sudden, the voice talked to me again. Mm. And you know the difference, because it's only happened twice in my life, mm. and I know the difference. It said, drop whatever you're doing, go down to Dodger Stadium, get Fred Clare, and ask him for an opportunity to play. So I did. I went down to the Los Angeles Dodgers in 1988 in the winter. I got into his office about 2 o'clock, and I asked his secretary for an audience. She Mm -hmm. said, well, he can't talk to you right now. He's in a meeting. I said, I'll wait. So an hour later, she came out to me and said, he's in another meeting. He can't talk to you. I said, that's okay. I'll wait. (laughs) It just kept going on. Three times she came out and said, he's in another meeting. I said, how can anybody meet that much in in one afternoon? But I knew now at that point that... um, uh, they were trying to get me to go home. Mm-hmm. They just didn't want to say no to me because I'd been in baseball now for 20-some-odd years right. already. They didn't want to turn me away, but they were hoping that I would leave. Well, I've never given up at anything. I stayed there until 7 o'clock at night. It was dark. I'd been there for five hours waiting in the lobby, and finally Fred stuck his head out the door and said, I guess I'm not going to get rid of you. I said, Fred, I've never quit at anything. Just give me a chance to talk to you for a little bit. And if it doesn't work out, no harm, no foul. God bless you. I'm gone. 
you know. So we talked for an hour, and I told Fred, I said, Fred, if you give me an opportunity here, I'll hit a home run every 24 at-bats. I'll drive in a run every five at-bats. You were in last place last year. We'll win our division. I'll change this pitching staff around along with Mike Sosha. Yeah. We'll win the World Series. I'll catch the last pitch, and I'll give you the ball. He goes, well, I should probably take a look at this at spring training, shouldn't I? I said, that'd be the smartest thing you'd do. So yeah. I left his office, got the invitation to spring training. Hold um, that thought. Yes. We're going to do what they call a cliffhanger. Hold that thought. Yeah. Because God truly was not done with you in baseball. N never. Not never by a long shot. That. Not, that, not at all. Stay with us. We'll be right back. More with Rick Dempsey. Take a look. This month, for a donation of any amount, the Word Network will send you this beautiful cross necklace inlaid with a beveled design and detailed with rhinestones, all set in a gold finish with beaded chain. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God. Wear this stunning cross as a statement of your faith or give it as a gift to family and friends. We appreciate your generosity and donation of any amount. So call now and your gold cross necklace will be rushed to you immediately. The phone number is 855-730-WORD. That's 855-730-9673. You can write us at Word Network Church, 20733 West 10 Mile Road, Southfield, Michigan, 48075 or simply go online to thewordnetwork.org and click the donate button. Thank you for supporting the Word Network. Because of your prayers and faithful partnership, we're sending the word of Jesus Christ to the hurting and lost around the world. The same time, featuring a brief cameo by Sammy Stewart as Jim Palmer. Get it? A brief cameo. Oh boy. Toward right, curling down toward the corner. They won't get it and it might get out. memories of a broken thumb to prove it. Ball tapped to the mound. Bale's going to go to the plate. Dempsey puts the tag on Bo Jackson and hangs on. Third down, six yards to go. The jewel of Dempsey's career was his MVP performance in the 1983 World Series. He hit 385 in the series with a record five extra base hits and twice thwarted efforts to steal by Joe Morgan, the only Philly who tried. The 83 club defined the word team, and true to form, the Orioles had many series heroes that year. Then, Eddie Murray and Rick Dempsey supported Scott McGregor's five-hit shutout. The cheering you hear is from Orioles fans. Everybody else is in muted silence. The pitch, line drive, Ripken catches it at shortstop, and the Orioles are the champions of the world. Dempsey is off to hug McGregor, and now the rest of his team mobs out there near the mound. This month, for a donation of any amount, the Word Network will send you this beautiful cross necklace inlaid with a beveled design and detailed with rhinestones, all set in a gold finish with beaded chain. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God. Wear this stunning cross as a statement of your faith or give it as a gift to family and friends. We appreciate your generosity and donation of any amount. So call now and your gold cross necklace will be rushed to you immediately. The phone number is 855-730-WORD. That's 855-730-9673. You can write us at Word Network Church, 20733 West 10 Mile Road, Southfield, Michigan, 48075 or simply go online to thewordnetwork.org and click the donate button. Thank you for supporting the Word Network. Because of your prayers and faithful partnership, we're sending the word of Jesus Christ to the hurting and lost around the world. If you're just joining us, we are speaking with Rick Dempsey. You know, this has been fascinating, really. I'm learning so much about the game and you as a person, but you had made some pretty lofty promises to Fred Clare. I did. With the Dodgers. <laughs> I mean, any did God tell you to tell him that? I mean, are you a prophet? I mean, no. go back a little bit. That's not what it, it's just, just this overwhelming feeling of confidence comes over your body. Wow. That no matter, that you're there for a purpose and, and a reason. And you know what you know. 
Mm-hmm. It comes from within inside. inside. Mm-hmm. And when I sat there in Fred's office and I said to him, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to hit a home run every 24 at bats, drive in a run, that's based on experience of knowing what I'm capable of doing. Sure. And I was so focused at that point in my career because I'd finally gotten a pink slip. I got released from a ball club, which I thought I would never do. Mm-hmm. And the reality of, of having to make a decision on what are you going to do with the rest of your life, I didn't know at that point. Bo Jackson had put an end to it, and I may never play this game again, and I'd have to move on. But something in my heart said, you're not finished yet. <clears throat> and I knew to go down there and ask Fred Clare for an opportunity to play yeah. and show what I could do one more time. 39 years old, but way over the hill, but still capable. And the Dodgers had a pretty good catcher by the they name of Mike Sosha. a Socha. great catcher. Did they no, not? They did. <laughs> and so I, I realized what my role would have to be, a part-time player. Right. Somebody was there to, um, to have an effect on the other players, to give them some advice, to give them some encouragement. You know, at this point in my career, I've experienced just about everything. Sure. And therefore, there were a lot of guys there, young players, uh, that really didn't know how to play the game of baseball, how to act in the game of baseball, what to expect, just how to go about normal life. Well, and how to handle the pressure once you guys reach exactly. the World Series. You'd been there. I had been there a couple times already. Yeah. So. Um, what happened by the end of that was one of the most amazing baseball seasons ever in the history of the game. Kurt Gibson, everybody remembers the oh, famous man. home run he hit in the first game of that World Series, how he limped around the bases <laughs> and, and gave us a start. But that was just what it is. is every, every game that we won was a testament to that fact that, that that day, you know, I got that little whisper in my ear that said, go down there and help make this thing happen. Yeah. Well... I had 150 at bats by the end of the season. I hit seven home runs, wow. one more than I predicted. Yeah. I hit exact. I drove in exactly 30 runs, yeah. 150 at bats. We won the division. I don't know how we did that. It wow. was amazing. We, um, uh, you know, Mike Sosha hit a big home run in, the, in that in that title uh, in the National League yeah. uh, to help us win that series against the Mets. We won the World Series against one of the toughest teams you're ever going to see, the Consecos and the Maguires of baseball. Uh, we had the most amazing pitching staff, young guys that didn't know what they were doing, how to put that uniform on. We, we pulled them through, but Oral Hershiser was the leader of it all. Yeah. 59 consecutive scoreless innings. The Bulldog, right? The Bulldog. <laughs> and, and he came through. I'd, I've caught 16 Cy Young Award winners through the course of my career. None of them ever had the kind of season Oral had that yeah. year. Voted the uh, um, Cy Young Award at the end of the season and the most valuable player of the World Series. And he's a strong believer, was he not? He was. Yeah, he is. I shouldn't say he was, but at that time, too, he was at the same time. Yeah. And just an amazing season. And, you know, there were just times when we knew good things were going to happen. It was that feeling. It was the gift that was sent to us at that time. Bob Costas called us the worst World Series team he'd ever seen on paper. Wow. But we absolutely just annihilated the Oakland A's at that time. We picked them apart, and it was all of our experience. And playing together, staying together, and all the things that we did together as a team. So, Do you have any regrets in baseball? One, I shouldn't have given Fred Clare the ball. It's worth over a million dollars now. <laughs> but I promised I would. But yeah. no, no regrets about baseball in a sense that you're, you're speaking about. It was a wonderful career. Yeah. Um, married my high school sweetheart, and she's been with me through baseball this whole time. That's very, very tough, tough life. too, isn't Absolutely. it? To stay married through a, a baseball career? You spend more than half. I've been married for almost 45 years now. I think I might have seen her 15, 20 of those years. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, anyway, no, it's been a tough, tough life on her, but she raised two wonderful children. I've got two boys and five grandchildren now, and they are my biggest gift ever. Yeah. So um, it's all been worth it. And so right now, yeah, at this point in my life, everybody thinks it's time to start, you know, uh, you know, slowing things down. I feel like it's my time now to start giving back. And it yeah. is just, I feel great. Well, again, talk about your faith and how it maybe sustained you through the, there had to be ups and downs and, and trials and tribulations and arguments with other players and managers. I mean, baseball is no different than what, any of us go through working at, you know, any job. 
It, it really is. I mean, I don't think there was anybody. It's kind of funny. Anybody who ever got in more fights than I did, sticking up for teammates and and things that go on for like. And you realize fighting is no good. But you know, it's not, it, it, it. I think in professional sports, it's part of your life mm-hmm. and everything. And you realize, I never held a grudge against any player. And anybody that ever said anything bad about me, if they were, if it was true, then you could never say anything about it. Mm-hmm. But I think. What you learn, and, and especially in, is you learn how to forgive, mm-hmm. and you learn how to be forgiven at the same time. And it doesn't mean that every day of my life I'm going to go out there and lead this amazing Christian life that says I don't do anything wrong and I know all the right answers because you don't. Mm-hmm. And and there's so many times you do things that you regret doing or you say things you regret saying. But if you always remember about that personal relationship where you can go to God and say, can you forgive me for this and help me to move on? He always will and always has. And so that's why I know phase two of my life is here now. Phase one, where I became a professional player and I made it through the tough times, is over with now. And I've got to put that behind me. But now I have an opportunity to help other people. And that's a gift again to go on and move on and take all my experiences in life, all the good and all the bad, and relay them to someone else and help someone else to have a good life. You know, being a Dodger fan here in L.A. in 88, you're right, that that was one of the most amazing World Series wins ever, and and you were a major part of it. Um, What was Tommy Lasorda like? Well, he was a lot of fun. I've never been around a manager who um, who really tried to make it fun. I played for Billy Martin, one of the no- most notorious yeah. managers in the game. Very tough to play for, but a good guy, a player's manager. But yell and scream also, too, and beat the game into you every single day. That was the way it was. Earl, uh, Earl Weaver, toughest manager and most miserable person I was ever around in my whole life. But a guy who I w- wouldn't ever, if I was to say... Um, would I ever play for him again? He's he's the only guy I would ever want to play for again because he yelled and screamed every single day. He demanded perfection, and we gave it to him. And we won in spite of him. We didn't beat the other team. We wanted to beat Earl. That was his program. But yeah. tough, tough manager. Tommy Lasorda was a lot of fun to play yeah. for. He came to me at a time in my career when we needed somebody to pat you on the back and tell you things were going to be okay. Tommy was a big part of us winning in 1988. You talked about giving back. You've had an amazing career, MVP for a World Series. Two. Can I see that ring real quick? You got it. Now this one was, you know, I'll hold it still and we'll get a close up of it. But this was what the uh, the Orioles. This is my Orioles, uh, a team I played every single day with, and I was lucky to be the MVP of that World Series. So um, I played with that organization for twelve years. Yeah. But you talk now about giving back. Yeah. What is that about? My biggest mission in life now is to help the... Oh, uh, I'm sorry, by the way, giving back. Okay. I better do that. Better get <laughs> the R. Adams Cali Shock Trauma Center in Baltimore. I've always looked for hmm. something along the charitable lines to really associate myself with and give 100% of my effort to. When I saw what Dr. Thomas Scalia has done with the shock trauma unit Mm -hmm. at University of Maryland Medical Center, I knew I had that little voice in my head again that said, this is it, Rick. This is what I want you to take control of and help them raise this money, $15 million, to complete a state-of-the-art facility Mm -hmm. that, yes, I know that it services the metropolitan area of Baltimore, but it services far more than that. Um, it services the world because now everyone realizes that Dr. Scalia and his amazing team of physicians saved 96% of all the people that come through those doors. And you don't come through those doors, you don't walk through. You come by helicopter or ambulance. So when there's trauma around that city, they all go. Shock trauma could be really anything, car wrecks and... Yeah. Mostly car wrecks, okay. but accidents that happened around, gunshots, whatever right. it might be. This facility will save your life. Mm-hmm. 96%, you've got a pretty good chance when you get through those doors and you're still breathing, yeah. that you will survive. Mm-hmm. And it's an amazing. And so now all of the medical facilities around the whole world, the hospitals are sending their doctors to Dr. Scalia to learn 
the program, the state-of-the-art kind of uh, program that they have to save lives Mm -hmm. every single day. The number one killer of kids and adults throughout the United States is trauma, and that's accidents that just happen. They want to know what Dr. Scalia is doing to save lives. And one of the biggest reasons why I got involved is now, in the times of the, the the wars that we're in Afghanistan and Iraq that we're dealing with now, we're sending our military doctors to Dr. Scalia to learn how to save lives and limbs in the field of battle. And that means more to me, not more than the people of Baltimore, but the fact that we that that we think that much of our troops that we want to be able to send the best doctors into the Dr. Scalia himself has gone to Iraq Mm -hmm. and gone to Afghanistan and been in the field of battle and sees what happens. Mm -hmm. The only way you're going to get that experience is to feel it and see it in person. He's done that. So now he has the the knowledge to train the world because all of these countries now are sending their people and their doctors over. So I feel this is my mission for the rest of my life is to help them complete this state-of-the-art facility and raise this last $15 million to get this done. And then I'll feel like I've, I've given enough back. Well, you've done a lot, and, and I just want to thank you. Yeah, this has thank been you, Paul. a great a pleasure to be great here. Great experience, a learning experience. How do people get in touch with you? Do you have a website or I do a memorabilia I, site? I mean, is that part of the, the Rick game? RickDempsey24.com is my website, and soon I will have an address that people can send their donations to. But I also have a post office box, and we'll put that up there for you at yeah. the same time uh, to send some data. And if you need to talk to me ahead of time, you can get through to me on my website. Just Write me a nice letter and let me know you want to talk to me about this donation or what goes on. I'll be more than happy to call you back and, uh, and, and fill you in on what's going on. But this is one thing I have to do. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm honored, and it's an honor to <laughs> have you here. You. Any last words? Just look right in the camera to our first word audience and anything you want to say No, nope. parting. You know, I've, I've been so fortunate and so blessed in my whole career to do what I have done. I've dined with presidents, kings and queens and debutantes of, around the entire world. And I've, I've been lucky to do that. Mm-hmm. But never forget your roots. Never forget yeah. where you came from and yeah. the influences you have. Listen to those voices that I've listened to because yeah. they will guide you and help you all the way. Yeah. And the Lord is, is Absolutely. been there every step of the way. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, he's always been with me. <laughs> yeah. So Bless you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed our time with Rick Dempsey. Stay tuned, and we'll see you next week. God bless you.